Hello, Spark Panda. Welcome back to Advancing Spark. Now, I haven't made a video for ages. I've been traveling around. And so obviously today I'm going to do a whole recap of the new AI Databricks SQL functions that have come in because they're really cool. And I keep seeing people talking about them and going, oh, I should probably have a look at those. So I've finally had a chance to take a look. So what we have is a load of foundation models that are now plumbed into Databricks. What does that mean? Well, you know, those big off the shelf models like ChatGPT, those big large language models that are hosted somewhere else that cost a huge amount of money and a huge amount of things to make. And actually, you just want to call a web service and use them rather than build your own thing, because not everything has to be rebuilt from scratch. Um, those things are now built into Databricks. So you can just go, I want to use a foundation model. I don't want to have to set up a separate subscription. Can I just ping a web service that's baked in and it will give me the answer using one of those externally hosted models. So they went and did that. That is now baked in to Databricks. You'll automatically have a load of model serving endpoints, which are your foundational model endpoints. And because they did that, they can go, well, why don't we just provide some functions that automatically use those things rather than every single company who wants to use those foundation models has to write the exact same web service call. Why don't they just make it something that's baked in? And if they're going to do that, why don't they just make it a SQL function? Which is exactly what they've done. So we're going to take a look at a bunch of new AI SQL functions. And all they're doing is just passing whatever you've asked it to into a web service, into the foundational model, scoring it by a big old large language model, passing the answer back. But just makes it easy. It means we can just bake it into our normal SQL functions, sling it into a view. And every time you run the view, it's going to charge you a little bit. So this does cost this pay per token or pay per click, essentially. So be a little careful about where you bake it in. If you just run hundreds of millions of rows through it, it's going to charge you money. You need to be aware of that. But it is very, very powerful. Loads of things we can do with it. So you'll see it came in fairly recently. You do need to be using a very, very specific data rich region. It's not in all the regions yet. I had to spin up an East US workspace, which makes me sad. It's not in Europe yet. Uh, and we'll have a look about how that works. So that's the plan. We'll take a look at the new SQL AI functions. We'll run a few of them. We'll see how they work. We'll see if they're any good. Uh, and yeah, we'll talk about how you might implement it. As always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments below what you actually think of these things. Are you using them? Have you got big plans for them? Do you see like uses for them outside of the, the very obvious... I'm making some demoware to show an exec kind of thing, but you can plug it into ETL. You can use it as part of data quality. You can use it as part of your processes in terms of building out a curated gold data model that you want to go and show to someone. Where do you guys see it fitting in? Super interesting. All right, so let's go and have a look what we're actually talking about. We got these new things. So AI functions that are using Databricks Foundation model APIs, bunch of things. So sentiment analysis, an age old example of, oh, a great thing AI can do, automatically give us some text and it'll say, is that positive or negative? Uh, classifying things, saying, here's a group of stuff. Can you please classify this to me? And I'll go, well, they're in that group, they're in that group. Extracting certain terms. Term extraction has been a massive part of document cracking for years and years and years. So the ability to go, well, here's a big chunk of a document. Can you just pull out like a person's name or the email address or the thing that they're referring to or the object that's being negotiated to in this legal clause, whatever you fancy. Fixing grammar. Hey, here's a big chunk of text. Can you make it so it actually sounds right? Like a, a, a real normal person wrote it? Yeah, it did. I mean, so many things that you can do with this stuff. Data masking is baked in there under AI mask. Similarity detection, loads and loads of stuff. And then on top of this, you do have the straight AI query, which is the I just want to sling a prompt. Allow me to sling a prompt in and then poke it against a foundational model. And that gives me absolute free form about what I'm going to do it. But it's these very, very task based ones that are actually super, super interesting. So I've grabbed a, a bunch of them, slung them into a notebook, and we can just have a bit of a play about how that works. Limits first. So you've got this because it uses the foundational model APIs then foundation models APIs have to be available in the region, in the Databricks region where your workspace lives. It also has to be pay per token. So for that to work, you have to have a little X in your box down here. And there aren't many of them currently. It's fairly, fairly new. It's just being rolled out. 
So Central US, East US, East US 2, North Central US. That is it. For Europe. <laughs> but it's fine. Again, it's new. We can try it out. We can test it out and see how it is actually working. So, yeah. Bear in mind, you might not see this working in your workspace unless you are one of those very, very specific ones that have been enabled as a pay-per-token user for foundational model APIs. If that is all right, then absolutely we can go and have a play. So I've got my Databricks workspace here. I've got a quick notebook that I spun up. Um, let's just, again, let's just have a quick play, make sure everything's working. Go, hello. So easy one, sentiment detection. I am a happy sparky boy. I once referred to myself on stage as a big old sparky boy and I'm never gonna live it down. So I might as well just share it with everybody. Is that positive or negative? Well, shockingly enough, that is a positive sentiment. The person who wrote that, pretty happy about things because they've said, I am happy. That's that's pretty good. Now, that on its own, not particularly amazing. Um, but when you actually start looking at that as, as at scale and you start actually looking at things, it starts to get interesting. That on its own, saying, I want to send one, one token. I want to get one response. I could just call it an API for that. I could just wrap that in a web service. The nice bit is when we can start doing it in some kind of set-based query. So I can come down and I've got my user feedback here. So I've got five different users that I've asked for feedback. And I've got a variety of interesting responses. Loved it. It was well good. You get me? Very, very London. Uh, that <clears throat> was banging. I've got the guy a bear is, which, you know, you need to be well up on your Gen Z slang to understand. Uh, better than a slap with a wet fish. A little bit of sarcasm. And I'd give it a five out of seven perfect score, which is a very niche Reddit joke. So a bunch of things, all generally positive. Uh, and interesting to see how it actually understands the nuance of language, right? It's not straightforward. I am happy. It was good. So we get that back and we see loved it. It was well good. You get me? Positive. Yeah, good. That was banging. Yeah, that's positive. The guy had bearers, which, you know, if, you, if you're down with the kids, you know, I mean, the, the guy was very, very charismatic. That is positive. And I just think it's neutral. Not amazing. Doesn't necessarily understand the latest slang. I give it a five or seven perfect scores. Positive. Better than a slap with a wet fish is positive. Although probably the most neutral positive, but a very, very British understated positive. But it's all pretty good. It's worked out. These are all generally good things that's saying. What I think is so slightly hard with that one is the fact that it is a gives you three responses. It's either negative, neutral, or positive. Normally with sentiment, it's good to get it. Uh, this is a 0 0.65, this is a 0 0.8. You know, so you can decide your own boundaries of actually how you're doing that stuff. But even so, the ability to have a giant table of different responses and just go, just, just do sentiment analysis and all of it. That's nice. That's easy. We've been able to do it by having our own models specifically built for that kind of thing, but it's nice not having to have to build them. But then we can get slightly, slightly more advanced. We can play with this stuff. I've got some very weird sentences people have said. So why don't we go and slap that into a fix grammar? So loved it. It was well good. You get me. How's it going to fix the grammar for that? Uh, the guy had bare is. Is that grammatically, uh, syntactically correct? And again, we can just run the same thing. We can just switch over, use one of the different AI functions that we're using, and just passing that text column into there as my parameter. I'm getting it back. Okay, loved it. It was well good. You get me? Loved it. It was very good. Do you understand? There we go. We're in, we're in good received pronunciation, as we call it uh, over in uh, Brentland. Uh, it is uncensored, uh, our swear words. So, you know, that is apparently not grammatically correct to have uh, swearing. The guy had bear is is apparently grammatically correct. Who knew? Uh, it's corrected my scoring system. It's now five out of five perfect score. And better than a slap when a wet fish is perfectly grammatically correct. Now, I like that. So, yes, no, some of the slang, it, it could have said that's not grammatically correct, but that depends if you think slang is. Uh, but it's managed to take something that was, that made sense to an English, <laughs> certainly a London person, uh, and then it's turned into something that's, that's actually fairly understandable. So, actually pretty successful. So, a bunch of those things, fixing grammar. Definitely an interesting one. Definitely one you don't see very often in a lot of the age-old cases. Sentiment score's been around for years. We're doing demos of that for years and years and years. Saying, take this sentence you've never seen before and fix the grammar of it. Actually fairly impressive to so just throw that in and go, just, just make that good. Again, 
thinking about it in ETL in terms of data correction, in terms of data correctness. Loads and loads of things you can do in there. Um, got another one doing extractions. So again, term extraction, document cracking, super interesting. Uh, Simon's great, but Gavi actually knows things. One, uh, just send the invoice through to this at isn'treal.com. Got more spam from you guys. Uh, yes, this is Simon. My cat, Mr. Sparkles, is feeling ill right now. Um, again, three sentences talking about different things. Uh, and we're saying, I want to have some feedback. So I want to extract certain things from there, from my feedback column. Tell me the person's name. I've said second person. This is me trying things out. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, I've said find an email. If it contains an email, bring it back. If it doesn't, just contain null. And pet's name. So when I was looking at uh, AI extract, when I was digging into actually how that works, you know, so it's it's talking about what's happening here. So it says content and labels. Just give it an array of your different labels. And it's when when I looked at it, I was like, okay, well, what are my choices? What are the what are the what are the extraction terms that I have to I'm allowed to ask for. And it's not, because it's a large language model. You can just give it anything you want. So I did a little test saying, is it going to realize that Mr. Sparkles is the name of my pet in this instance, because it's a cat? So we can run that. We can try it. We can see how it works. Um, and yeah, it takes a little while, this one, because it's doing some interesting stuff. And there's a few different tokens I'm trying to extract from that one uh, sentence. But actually, pretty impressive. So we go for the first one. It has worked out. Simon is a person. So the person's name in this context is Simon's first one I came across. There isn't a second person. So when I first ran this, it just, I didn't have second person. I had name, email, and pet's name. And it came out as Simon, null, and null. So it didn't recognize that there's two people in that conversation. So some interesting nuances if you're trying to do things. If you're trying to do like a, a regex extract, then you say, well, which of the recognized things do you want? And you get a little array of things. Currently, which came back a single one, the first one it finds. And as to how you need to build that, I don't know. Interesting. Uh, just send the invoice through to this. It isn't real. So there's no name in there. There's no person in there, but it has recognized the email and it's extracted that nicely. Again, could have used regex to do that. But again, the, the things I'm asking for are completely arbitrary. Um, and then, yes, this is Simon. My cat, Mr. Sparkles, is feeling ill right now. Uh, and yeah, we've got... I managed to actually scroll down. We can see the name is Simon. There's no second bed. There's no email. But the pet's name is Mr. Sparkles. So actually, as a term extraction, anything the large language model can feasibly recognize within that text, you can then just call out as a thing to extract from there, and it'll work. And it comes out as a, as a nice structured array that we can then take and explode and use for other things further down the line. So yeah, super, super interesting for doing some actual practical use cases, for receiving some data and just extracting some common stuff so you can apply structure. It'll be cheaper if you use regex. If I just had a straight regex uh, extract with a regex pattern that recognized the email address, that's not going to give me that paper token cost. So if you had a load of text, then the only thing you needed to extract was a date or an email or something that is very easily pattern recognizable, I wouldn't bother using that. It's going to cost me money. But if something that is so arbitrary and so weird and doesn't follow a pattern, such as Mr. Sparkles, the name of my cat. And there's no way to predictably do it via something that's not going to call to externally. And I want to be able to extract that. Well, I can now do it. I can now say just, yeah, go look for the name of my brother in this big chunk of text. And it'll try and work that thing out. It'll pull it out and it'll give me the context. The name of that film I watched last night. If it's in a big chunk of documentation, I can recognize it and pull it out. Definitely, definitely super interesting use cases. It's just that balancing act of how much are you going to pay for it? Um, how much do you want to be pushing it through and kind of uh, working with that stuff? Now, that is a question that immediately comes up. So the moment you say, paper click, pa paper token. Well, how many tokens? Can I control it? How do I see what's going on? Uh, so I want to show you that briefly. Uh, if we grab this uh, over here, we've got serving. So I mentioned that the these foundational models are what all the, the different functions are based on. So you can see I've got a bunch of different models. So I can't actually see the name sticking out here. A bunch of different foundational models that I've actually got. If I zoom out, that'll probably be easier. There we go. So I've got Mixtral, Llama, BG, MPT. There's a few different ones that are running. 
And when we go on the different functions, so AI extract, for example, it tells us at the top, currently it's using the Mixtool 8x7b. So it's the, in the documentation, it'll say which of my various foundational models this particular function's using. They do say to reserve the right to switch it around. You're using a black box function. They might find one that goes faster. And so they're going to switch it and say, actually, we're going to use that one now. They're committing to keeping that up to date in the documentation if they do that. So we'll, we'll see how that works. But in this one, we know that it's running on that Mixtral X7B uh, instruct. So we can dig into it. We get a bit of a description. We get some information about what's going on. We can see the price. So it is 21.428 DBUs per 1 million tokens. So actually not particularly expensive in the grand scheme of things, but there is a price associated. So you can go and have a look at what, how much you're paying for DBUs in your Azure region, AWS region, or whatever, whatever pricing model you are actually under. At least you have a method of translating that back into cost and working out, right. So I've got a million records. It's going to cost me X amount. And you can start to figure that out and decide how much you're using it. It'll change how you think about ETL. If you're like, ah, I can just reprocess the data. It doesn't really matter. It's spark. It's big and chunky. Yeah, I'm going to pay for every single record I put through it. I need to think a little bit about when I want to score it, when I don't want to score it. Maybe only certain records I put through this extraction if it wasn't clear. Maybe I try and do it through regex. Anything that doesn't get populated, I then put through a foundational API as a next step. So I only do the ones that are harder. I carve off the ones that are easy that I don't want to pay for. Different ways we can think about it. The other thing you do have in here is we go up here, we've got the change rate limit. So I can come in here and go, I do not want people to abuse this. Actually, each user is only allowed one query per minute. Or each endpoint is allowed one query per, unit, uh, per minute across all users. So we have, we have some ability to put a little bit of ring fencing, a little constraints. We can, we can calm people down if we think they're going to go absolutely nuts and spend all of our money. Do remember you've got that. Now, again, that is on the foundational API serving endpoint of the one that you're using. So if you look at a particular API function, again, our AI extract is on this mixture one. I could put rate limits on there. If someone uses a different function that's using a different foundational API, you'll need to make sure the rate limits are on there as well. So a couple of things to think about, a few things to think about how we actually work with this stuff. But yeah, generally, Super easy, in insanely easy to just throw it in and get started and go, oh, well, cool, that well, that just works. Some nuance, as with all text and language type stuff, semantics are always going to be awkward. If you're using some weird slang, if people are doing sarcasm, sarcasm notoriously hard to find for thinking like determining sentiment. Um, but just, yeah, so many interesting text extraction based use cases. So many people out there in the world telling you you have to buy a specialist text analytics tool to be able to do anything. Well, you don't. You can just bake this stuff into your normal ETL, push everything through, call it as a SQL function, have a special view that does it in the SQL function for your translations when you're pulling things out, but don't make it translate it every single time because you're going to pay per click. Don't expose this behind a dashboard. Madness. Yeah. Interesting things. So go check them out. Again, only if you've got a workspace in those sport regions in the US. Uh, hoping we'll see them at any point that's got any of the normal, uh, the um, reserved um, foundational APIs. We'll just see those paper token ones start to appear. But yeah, no, super interesting. Go, go have a play, go explore, see what you can find. See if you can trick it. See how wrong it gets things. See how much it impresses you that it actually gets things right at scale with large amounts of data. Yeah. Anyway. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.